this talk um, is about sci-fi, um, which in, in a sense is kind of a bit of a weird topic for Paul, maybe. Um, but it, it, it kind of says a bit about where I'm coming from, which is, um, most of you probably won't know. I, I come from a kind of uh, humanities background, uh, kind of cultural theory. So my PhD was looking at how um, food movements are represented, uh, and more broadly environmental activists are kind of represented, and how the role that narrative plays in in a lot of that. So <coughs> I say that because um, there might be, understandably, a bit of a kind of so what factor in terms of how you respond to this. And I want I want to flag that because I actually want if that is something you think at the end of the talk, then um, please like say that um, because uh, I'm really interested in how where I'm going in the future, what can be taken forward from from this type of research and this way of thinking. Um, and I'm going to leave some kind of questions open at the end, because actually, genuinely, I, I don't know. So that the work that I'm doing now, it's definitely inter interesting to think about narrative and how knowledge is, is transferred um, at the grassroots level. So that, that's still there in, in my thinking, but it's, it's the, the research is more kind of on the ground and the applications may be a bit kind of clearer. So before I kind of waffle on for another half an hour, um, I'm just going to play you a clip, just because because I think it's kind of a good idea, maybe, and it kind of flags some of the, the issues um, that I want to talk about. Uh, I should just say, um, does anyone know this film, Silent Running? Anyone familiar with it? Mm -hmm. Is it a film where there's <coughs> like an artificial growing space in a spaceship? That's right, yeah. And a little android. Or right. Yeah. So the basic plot is that Earth is this kind of weird, kind of homogenous, utopia, dystopia place where they don't uh, have any kind of plants anymore. They've managed to kind of engineer the, the environment so they don't need that. Uh, and as a kind of insurance policy, they've sent out um, a kind of library of specimens into space just, just in case everything blocks up on Earth. Um, and the Basically, the story starts with a, a kind of skeleton crew who are managing one of these kind of biodomes where they keep a lot of the stuff alive, um, and there's kind of tensions there. Um, and the kind of main protagonist is, is at the centre of this. His, his, his name's Lau, and he'll be the one talking mostly in this. Um, and he he's really keen on the, the kind of nature element. He wants he loves it, uh, and the rest of the crew are kind of indifferent to it. But anyway, I'll play the clip now, and you'll hopefully see. Come back. 
that to Lau later on. Um, but yeah, this I just wanted to kind of pick out two main ideas from that. So the idea that this is a kind of powerful way of summing up some kind of complicated issues. So I could say ideas, but I want to talk about kind of narrative. So kind of a basic story. Um, and Lau, on the one hand, articulates very powerfully the, the kind of political power that comes through being able to determine what, what you eat uh, and the diversity that comes through that. And on the other, it's the kind of invisibility of um, problems in situations where power is concentrated. So the, basically the other crew can't really see what it is that he's talking about. They don't understand. So they're the two ideas, the kind of invisibility of, of the problem, but also the idea that, that this kind of narrative can be uh, powerfully articulated through, um, through science fiction. Um, so what I'm kind of addressing here is, I think, uh, hopefully a, a kind of trope that you might recognize, which is the kind of idea of that we need new narratives. Um, this is a, a kind of a good example. I literally just typed new narratives into Google, and this is what it kind of spewed out. Um, and, but you know, I was at the Oxford Real Farming Conference the other day, and there were, I think, three uh, sessions. One of them was in the kind of main hall, where that was the main issue, was talking about how do we find new narratives? How do we tell stories that, that engage people? So I think this has like a general application that, that people are kind of floundering around trying to find uh, new narratives. And uh, basically what I kind of want to ask is, what does science fiction, um, I guess there's, there's a weak and a strong argument that I might have here and rehearse here. One is radical thought has clearly kind of emerged alongside science fiction and informed it and there's been a kind of kind of back and forth between what science fiction says and what's happening politically on the ground. So that's the kind of weak thing. It's just a historical, a genealogy, if you like, of, of radical thought. The other is, can we take what happens in sci-fi and make social movements better in some kind of direct way? Can we, can we take these ideas, we've seen that they're clearly mobilizing, and, and bring them into social movements and, and, and strengthen them somehow? So just a quick overview of what I'm going to talk about. So, the, the first is you know just narratives in kind of largely industrial food production uh, and some of the key I want to pull out again two ideas from from that then think about na narratives in in kind of resistance in social movements in grassroots social movements um, give you some examples from uh, from actual science fiction texts and, and, and films um, and then offer you some tentative conclusions uh, and then it can't work. Um, okay, so just the, the narratives and industrial food production. So we'll all have seen this. This is probably the second most overused picture in, in these kind of talks about industrial food production. Does anyone know what this is? Irrigation. Yeah. Cent center ir pivot irrigation. Does anyone know where it is? Spain. Actually, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, US Australia. <laughs> <laughs> it's not Australia. <laughs> <laughs> do that. I, I don't know and I don't care. Um, and that's kind of the point. Point. Is that I kind of As I was looking, I was like, well, I probably should know where this is. And actually, I noticed that there was a, a residence here that it doesn't matter where it, where it is. In fact, you know, it, it, the people that are doing this um, are actively want to conceal the fact that they are doing it. You know, you're not going to see that on on your kind of product at the end of the day. So this is why I kind of called the talk Food From Nowhere, which is obviously this kind of phrase that some of you, some of you might have encountered. And it was, um, so Jose Bové and this other guy, I don't know, um, used it as a way of kind of framing what's kind of happening in industrial food production. Like these ideas are kind of coming, food is coming from somewhere, but we don't know where, and it may as well be anywhere. Um, and, uh, so that's, and, 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 and I guess the idea that I really want to emphasize here is it, it kind of, the people making that food actively don't want you to kind of realize that. Um, and so this, this was something that kind of broke last year, that there was like these fake farms that Tesco were making up, because they know that you actually do want to have food that's from somewhere. Um, and it was kind of a bit of a scandal, and you know, apparently it's, it's actually kind of endemic to um, certainly uh, supermarket uh, distribution uh, of foods that they're, that they're trying to kind of fabricate this, this, this 
provenance, the authentic provenance of food. Um, the other thing is like weirdly kind of actually kind of opposite to that is the kind of triumphantism, if, that, if that's a word, um, of the the kind of in, of, of the industrial food, uh, of the pro corporate food regime. You know that there are instances where they do want to kind of show that and go, look at what we can do, look at all the might that we have at our disposal and how we're able to kind of refashion the world um, and get away from the kind of pesky and irritating inconsistencies and unevenness of, of soils and things like that. Um, so this is um, what I would call, and you know, echoing um, Oliveira and, and Hecht, this idea of kind of a neo-nature that um, has been kind of um, in this kind of triumphant way announced and is often kind of announced if you look at on any kind of major uh, industrial food producer, um, they will probably play on this kind of high-tech uh, modernism um, that they have kind of have at their disposal and they're able to kind of construct. So they, they define it as a kind of radical reorganizing of the world. Um, one that's geared towards the use of land essentially as a substrate. So going back to that idea, it doesn't matter where you do the production, because it's you can create the substrate that you want and grow whatever you want there at any time of the year. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and as a substrate to grow these kind of genetic assemblages, um, i.e. foods that would kind of tailor to our, to our needs, irrespective of the, the effects that they, they cause. To go back to the other side, I think, and to Trump, apparently, um, I just thought, you know, this is science fiction in a sense is interested in these kind of moments because it's about reclaiming uh, the weirdness of this. So th th I just thought I'd take another step back to give you an example that this is quite, I thought was quite funny as well. The Sunday Herald, which is a Scottish newspaper, um, listed the television coverage of the Trump inauguration as if it was a Twilight Zone episode. Um, so it's and I think that they must have been kind of writing it out and going, this is weird, like, why is this happening? And that actually science fiction offered a uh, something in which they could kind of register that weirdness. This is not normal, that we should, we should be thinking of that we're in the twilight zone. Um, so it has that capacity um, to reclaim the weird, is what I would want to call it. But other science fiction theorists, have, um, so the very important science fiction theorist called Darko Suvin, um, who calls it cognitive estrangement. So there's this kind of idea that there's a, a system of, uh, of the way things are organized and that um, in rendering it in a kind of science fiction framework, we see it again as if for the first time, or we see it as if for the first time. Um, I and mean, this is why Kim Stanley Robinson, who's another science fiction writer, stopped really writing sci-fi and started writing uh, stories about what's happening now in terms of climate change um, and he, because he, he felt actually we're already effectively co-authoring our own science fiction novel in changing the, the planet in the way that we are um, but also at the same time it makes these kind of things graspable I mean you know so do photos right but um, science fiction narratives have you know more depth they can, you can engage with them more you can identify with people that are going through these kind of things um, so they're graspable and visible but at the same time they retain the kind of weirdness of, of a sci-fi horror and so this actually this guy Martin Faber um, is, is another science fiction writer who's kind of interested in that bringing back the kind of weirdness making us see again what has become normalized um, so that's the kind of that's how I think industrial food production is, it has, has in, by some, been understood and, and, and narrativized. Um, and over and against that, you have something like food sovereignty. Um, so this is the kind of second part of my talk. Um, food sovereignty, when you look at that list, and you know, I think this is deliberate, it looks eminently sensible. It's really grounded. It's like, who would disagree with any of these things? You know, it's focused on food for people, and values food providers, localizers. These are all like obvious, homespun, kind of clearly commonsensical things. It wants you to think that, uh, and that's because it's actually true. But um, so there is that. So it looks like, on the one hand, you've got science fiction uh, or industrial capitalism as this kind of mad system, um, this kind of system of sorcery that that kind of um, takes 
the land from beneath your feet and that asks you to be happy for that and sends you uh, food stuffs from all over the world and doesn't kind of explain how. It's a kind of magical system almost. Um, and that's certainly the way that it's been greeted in, in certain parts of the world, actually, over and over again. For example, in um, Guatemala, so you have um, Asturias, uh, Men of Maize, which is, you know, actually, it positions the kind of capitalists as this kind of this mad, sacro-religious world that comes and ch enchants everyone and, and kind of uh, turns these kind of maize figures into gods. This is not my area of specialty at all, but it's that, that those tropes have been live in, in the way in which cultures have kind of understood the operation of industrial capitalism for a long time. Um, and over against that, you have this kind of this simple way of life that, that is clearly the best way to go. But it isn't as simple as that, because at the same time, it just seems completely unrealistic at the same time. And I'll play on that. So this is probably a phrase that you might recognize, which kind of came out of the, I think, came out of the, the kind of May 68 uprisings in, in Paris. And there is the, the sense that even though what you're saying is clearly sensible, a, a, you know, a socially and environmentally sustainable food system, is also at the same time kind of mad um, and, un, and unrealistic or impossible. Um, so how does that kind of play out is, is kind of interesting and some of the questions I want to kind of explore. Um, and and this, is, this is recognized by, I mean, I've chosen two examples from McMichael, um, but uh, actually the language around food sovereignty, it does have this kind of fantastical element as well. So McMichael talks about concrete utopianism. Um, and that the significance of the food sovereignty movement is that in the narrative of ca capitalist mod modernity, it's projects that are virtually unthinkable. Um, so we get moments like this, that, that, um, where, that for me really kind of stand out. This is the Minnesotan people in, in, in Canada, indigenous people um, resisting industrial development of their land. And you can, it's like just this woman on a bridge, and she's, you know, the military force that she's repelling. Um, and I think there's something just amazing about that, um, that can only, that really does push us towards the kind of the fantastical. Um, and yeah, it's not just about this kind of eminent sensibility of it, there's something else that's being drawn on in terms of resistance to it. So I wanna move now, so this is the, the kind of final bit of the talk. Um, how much time do I have? Uh, yeah, it's a bit of time. Um, so, does anyone know? Does anyone know Robert Heinlein? Okay, yeah, not not very. I mean, he's not very popular. Although he did write uh, Starship Troopers, which some of you might have seen. Um, but he's got, he's got a bit of a mixed. I'm going to ignore his actually his his politics. But this is a really good example. Um, and I, I'm I'm going to give you some examples now, and they're going to kind of span. Um, 50 years, 50, 60 years of, of SF um, production. But this is a kind of, this is a good starting point, I think. It's, the story is, there's a moon colony which produces all, all of Earth's food. So already you can see there's a kind of colonial food system kind of situation emerging. Uh, that colony revolts and refuses to, to continue supplying the Earth with food in the way that it has done historically. Um, and at that moment, Earth kind of realizes it's screwed. Um, because it needs the food, uh, and it would really like the fact that it could get it for cheap uh, from the moon. Um, and so it actually ends up that they're, they're so desperate, they invite some delegates from the moon to Earth, and they have this really interesting conversation about sovereignty, uh, where the people on Earth are, I think Tripoli, um, people on Earth are like, Sovereignty doesn't mean anything. It's just an abstract concept. You know, we're not going to talk about that. You know, just all annulling the kind of the, the conversation even before it's begun. Uh, and they come back strongly and say, the quote I've got here: the "Sovereignty of free living is not the abstract matter you seem to feel it is." And the way that they articulate that and have done throughout the book, you know, this is actually in the earlier part of the book, but the, the way that that's constantly asserted is in the terms of environmental sustainability. So there's an ecological dimension to the food sovereignty. 
Um, and again, you'll notice that even though this language is kind of like against the madness of shipping embedded energy across the hundreds of thousands of miles of space to Earth, rather than growing it there, um, they, they have this clear kind of, it's clearly the sensible thing to do is to, is to you know, have food sovereignty for both the moon and, and Earth. But this language is still kind of laced with the kind of fantastical. So the miracle of photosynthesis, the plant and animal cycle is a closed cycle. You have opened it, and your lifeblood runs downhill to Terra, which is Earth. You don't need high prices. One cannot eat money. What you need, what we all need, and the end of this loss. So it's the, the actual seizing of, of, of power on, on Luna is really an anticipation of the food sovereignty movement. Um, and the way that they kind of articulate and describe it is not just a, a really meticulous kind of uh, description of, of how that would work spatially, but in, but in terms of area as well, they have these kind of these tunnels, like polytunnels, and they really measure everything out. But it's also about political distribution of, of distribution of power. Um, so, but I wanted to use the example because it's a really good example of food sovereignty as a kind of ecological through ecological sustainability. Um, and I want to talk more about political power as this. So this is even probably less well known than, than that. Um, does anyone know this? This is a 1970s series called Survivors. Anyone see it? So good. Um, it's quite hard to talk about because it's three series and loads happens in it. But the basic premise is uh, one person out of every th thousand survives some kind of in indeterminate kind of biological catastrophe. Um, and the first couple of ep episodes are basically a kind of lurid narrative about what happened, you know, the kind of the craziness of, of, of that. Um, but then it quickly settles down into one of the most earnest political explor explorations I've ever encountered of, of um, lots of things, but specifically food. So obviously food becomes a, a key issue quite quickly. Um, and they naturally rely on the foodstuffs that have been kind of left over from the old world, um, uh, stockpiles of, of resources and such. Um, um, but very quickly the conversation emerges about the political importance of being able to self-determine, to be able to make again the things that had once only come through some kind of um, incomprehensible industrial supply chain. Um, and yeah, it really, I guess the, the SF kind of conceit here is that, well, this is what, this is the situation we're in now. This is the cognitive estrangement that we look again at this. This is us in the supermarket. I mean, it, there is this mad thing that's happened and everyone's died, but they're kind of desperately dependent on this unsustainable system. Um, and so they find themselves kind of scampering around supermarkets and everything. And they realize that they need to, to do something else. So the kind of the early plot sees them, the, the, a kind of group of protagonists, going round in an itinerant fashion to lots of different settlements. So you get the kind of anarcho-syndicalists, you get the trade unionists, you get uh, environmentalists, you get feudalists, you get, and then each episode is almost, you know, oh, how would that society organize itself? Um, the, the, the political, po the sense of political possibility is so rich in this show. Um, so you have that, and then they eventually decide, no, none of these things work for us, we're going to set up our own community, um, and then that's kind of the rest of the, the, the series, is them earnestly exploring what it means to be uh, self-subsistent. Um, and one of the things I wanted to highlight here, because you know, Philip talks about loads of stuff, but um, it's the, the sense in which the decisions they make about food production <laughs> How, how attentive they are to the political, um, which <coughs> political dimensions of that. So it, it, one, it, in one moment, someone comes to their farm and says, oh, you, you, you don't know what you're doing. Like, you need to completely change your, your farming system. You, you should be uh, keeping your animals indoors so you can collect the muck, and then you can make fuel from that. And he's saying, you know, to farm properly, you've got to have power, and that is by which he means kind of electric power. And it's a matter of simple priorities. And on that notion of the kind of where are your priorities, 
emerges this <coughs> idea of um, what, what are we producing when we're producing food or when we're farming? Are we just producing material output or are, or are we producing social goods? And really importantly, they reject this guy's proposal. You know, it's factory farming. They're worried about the welfare of the animals, but they're also worried about their, themselves as a community because if they don't grow cabbages on that field and instead they grow crops that can be used for, um, for biofuels, then it's their sweat and toil going in to make that and for what? For who? Um, and they're constantly aware that those decisions really directly affect their kind of their political freedoms, um, and that's that lies at the surface of all the, the narratives. I could talk about loads of other episodes. Um, oh yeah, that's basically. Oh, and and to, but just to cap that off, this is food sovereignty as um, as a manifestation of political freedom, or at least of democracy. So jumping forward a few years now, has anyone seen this? Probably a few more people have seen this. Interstellar, um, Charlie Cox, or Christopher Nolan, I can't remember. Um, really, really good film, I love it, but I'm really troubled by the narrative that really under underlies it. Um, and this is to say, Science fiction isn't always just about radical narratives. They're, they're narratives, and they can go either way. They can have different political implications. And I think in this instance, is a, a kind of interesting change. So the basic story here is Earth is kind of utterly depleted, um, and they want to go, they want to use wormhole technology to find a new planet and repopulate it. And the, the protagonist is a farmer uh, and you're going to get lots of shots like this, you know, dreary shots of corn. Um, and the, the idea is that he hates being a farmer and that farming is the kind of lowest and most squalid thing you could possibly do. Um, and being a spaceman is the best thing you could possibly do. We're, we're explorers, not caretakers, he spits at one point. And it's this kind of contempt for being someone that would steward uh, a, a, just one planet. Um, uh, so yeah, that, that, that is a completely different way of thinking about it. And I would position that in a kind of an, a narrative of kind of limitless westward expansionism, which you know, is still really strong in a, a lot of ways that people think. And you know, it's to, to, then to talk about the next example, um, we're all aware of what's his face, uh, Elon Musk, and his uh, you know, efforts to get us to Mars, why? Um, I mean, my, in my more cynical moments, I just think, well, just to distract us from the complicated, you know, complicated Earth, uh, the, the politics of, on Earth. Um, and this is a good example of that, because I think that e this is even more unconscious, the way that this kind of pushes food out of the picture. Uh, has everyone seen this? Um, again, I loved it as a film, but just reading it for its kind of unconscious ideological structures, it's really, again, fascinating. So yeah, for those who don't know, Matt Damon is, is stranded on Earth, uh, on Mars, uh, and he tries to survive initially by taking the potatoes that are in the ship's rations and germinating new potato plants. And it's really interesting, like, oh, I'm awesome, like food sovereignty on Mars, great. Uh, and he does it, he, he almost gets there, and you're like, you want him to, you want him to succeed, and then, oh no, it, it, you know, the frost gets in or something, and all the potatoes die, and you're like, oh my god, that's crazy, like, how's he gonna survive? And then he's just rescued. <laughs> and so, <laughs> you just, you, that, that for me was like a really interesting moment, because it just, food just falls out of the, the, the set of concerns. It, it was this, but everyone understands it as a kind of plot device, that like, oh, he's gotta, he's gotta grow the potatoes, and he's, sac he's sacrificing something, he's hazarding something, and like, in, in not eating the potatoes, but like making food, more food out of them. Um, and then it's just forgotten about. Um, and I, th I found that really troubling um, as a kind of more unconscious rejection of, of farming. You know, small scale farming um, doesn't matter and it never did. Um, that's the way I read it. Um, I know it's a, you know, I know what it is as a genre and that is a huge thing. It's, it's, a, it's a survival story and, you know, this is a, clearly a piece within that. But if we are thinking about what narratives have currency right now, um, this is troubling for me. 
um, because you can just do that, and it's you know anyone that was a farmer would find that I think repugnant. Um, and this is just the, the last one. So th this for me is the 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 best example because Survivors was remade in two thousand and eight, um, and I bet you can guess where what happened in it. There was just no the food element was just completely gone. It wasn't even a hint of that. They just unquestionably relied on, on stockpiles, and there were new concerns. Um, I mean, immigration is, 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 a, is somehow you know, at the surface, well, that, and that's fine. Um, I'm not saying that this remake was completely vapid. I mean, it's close to it, close to it, but, um, but, it, but the, the fact that food has completely fallen out of, um, has ceased to be uh, something that will really mobilize people, clearly mobilize people. That, that's a decision that was made consciously or unconsciously, but powerfully um, and tellingly, um, I think. So some conclusions. Um, and this is a bit I really struggle with. Because um, there's certainly no simple rule. Um, like I said, you can't just take, well, I guess in answer to my own question, you clearly just can't take these things and wholesale and put them into social movements. Um, there's always tensions there. Um, so even the idea of utopia, which is this kind of has a lot. Does everyone know the the kind of problem with the world word utopia? Is it great for a world that will never exist? Or something? Kind of, yes. Yeah. So it was a term that was coined. Two words. It was a kind of wordplay by Thomas More. So it's actually the 500th anniversary of Utopia mm. last year. Um, he took two Greek words that sound the same, uh, both Utopia. Um, but one means good place, and one means no place. So it's this idea of it's the impossibility of, of, of it. He knew that in in writing the Utopia, which actually was really a, a reaction to enclosures. Um, it's actually about food, really. Um, but anyway, so that's there. So we're talking about utopia. We'll have to be aware of that tension that we're talking about something that can't ever really exist. Um, so, and that is actually in this you know, line, which I'm now re-quoting from Michael about, you know, this is unthinkable, um, and maybe that's a problem. Um, so I didn't really cover this, but I think, you know, overly positive visions of, of the future can fall flat with moral intent. Um, a negative one can just make us feel really bad. Um, and again, this kind of notion of the unconscious. The, I think science fiction ha has currency, and you know, science fiction is successful or not because of how they key into kind of general thinking and general tensions, but they play on those well enough. Um, again, that makes it really hard to enlist them straightforwardly. And just to go back to Lau, and I deliberately showed you that that in that clip, that I kind of chose a very key part of it, but, you know, let's face it, actually, you don't know, but um, he goes on and just kills everyone. He kills everyone on the, on the, on the, pl on the ship to, 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 for food sovereignty, um, and just goes off on his own into, into space. I mean, it's not, it's, it's problematic, <laughs> to say the least. Um, you can't really just, yeah, it's not, so that was just to kind of say, to, to kind of almost resolve that by saying, oh, there's some real problems with this, this kind of stuff. And some of this, even some of the stuff he says immediately afterwards, like pause and didn't let you see, you know, it, it's some really dodgy stuff, you know. <laughs> and even like just the kind of, the really like hammy kind of, oh, I want to lay down in a meadow stuff, that's going to turn people off. So yes, yeah, I'm never suggesting that science fiction has kind of got all these things that are ready to go and can be like, spliced and put into social movement context, not at all. That said, I want to end on some positives. So I think it is important to acknowledge how radical thought has kind of emerged alongside cultural output. And if we don't see that, then we get half the picture. Um, and equally for those working with culture to think about the ways in which culture influence, you know, cultural output, artic, artistic output influences, you know, more live kind of political context. Uh, and they do have do have a simple power. That's undeniable. Um, you know, we could go to all the conferences we like on international political economy, but you know, we need to find some way to distill those ideas 
um, or even material science for that matter, um, uh, distill those ideas in such a way that they can be understood and uh, can be taken up by anyone. Um, and then finally, there's just kind of like, maybe there's, an, uh, there's a way that this can go, thinking about, does anyone know the Overton window? Anyone heard that? Is it um, related to ideas and what you consider as ridiculous, say, and Yeah, exactly, yeah, it's the kind of, yeah, it's actually the narratives and ideas which are consider considered to be plausible at any kind of given moment, and the idea is that they move around, it moves around. Actually, it has a lot to do with the kind of spectrum, so what's considered to be left-wing at a certain point in history, you know, might change and move depending on what's happening uh, politically. Um, so Jeremy Corbyn's a good example. Like Everyone's like, oh, he's just really radical left-wing. But like, if, if he was doing what he was doing in the 1970s, for example, I think he would have been considered a lot more centrist. Uh, but it's just, you know, have the kind of contingency of, of a certain kind of political idea. Um, and, and that's maybe something what, that we can take from this and think, when we're, when we're trying to mobilise, when we're trying to tell people stuff that we think will make the world better, then <coughs> we kind of need to think about what are people going to see as ridiculous, fantastical, sensible, um, and, and obviously we do already do this. I'm not saying that like, we're just blindly chucking information at people. It's very, we are very strategic. Um, but yeah, is this something that people look at and go, yeah, I, I see myself in that, or do they look at it and go, that's just mad? And we need to have some kind of sense of, of, of that. Um, otherwise, if we are dealing with social movements, I know everyone here isn't necessarily, but we're interested in social change, then yeah, they're gonna be less effective, I think. Um, but yeah, that's basically everything I had to say. Um, so if there are there any questions or thoughts or whatever? <coughs>